Go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy to get 20% off your first month of cognitive behavioral therapy with weekly sessions online with a therapist in addition to worksheets, a journal, meditation and yoga videos and unlimited messaging. There's strong evidence that CBT can help people who hoard and accessing therapy online can be affordable and accessible. Find out more and get your discount at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy. A lot can happen in the next three years. Like a chatbot may be your new best friend. But what won't change? Needing health insurance. United Healthcare tri-term medical plans are available for these changing times. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, they offer budget-friendly, flexible coverage for people who are in between jobs or missed open enrollment. The plans last nearly three years in some states, with access to a nationwide network of doctors and hospitals. So for whatever tomorrow brings, United Healthcare tri-term medical plans may be for you. Learn more at UH1.com. I'm Sandra, and I'm just the professional your small business was looking for. But you didn't hire me, because you didn't use LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn has professionals you can't find anywhere else, including those who aren't actively looking looking for a new job but might be open to the perfect role like me in a given month over 70 percent of linkedin users don't visit other leading job sites so if you're not looking on linkedin you'll miss out on great candidates like sandra start hiring professionals like a professional post your free job on linkedin.com slash spoken today hey there it's michelle norris i'm host of a podcast called your mama's kitchen when i travel i'm usually looking for a way to find a taste of home when i'm not at home and one of the things i love to do when i am at home is entertain and airbnb allows me to do that when i was in california recently i rented a house that had a great kitchen and when we were sitting around the table we're all thinking we're in someone else's house someone could be in all of our homes as well if you have a home but you're not always at home you have an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Welcome to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. I am drowning in stuff and trying to find a way out. Listen as I explore the issues and delve deep as somebody profoundly affected by hoarding disorder Find out more, including links to subscribe to the podcast and all my social media at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Finally, I am not a doctor. I'm just a hoarder doing her best. So do seek professional support if and when you need it. So I am here with Jenna Overbar, a therapist who specializes in working with people with OCD. She is the host of the All the Hard Things podcast. She has contributed to research on hoarding and she uses exposure and response prevention therapy with the people she works with. Jenna also has personal experience of OCD and given the links between OCD and hoarding, I thought she would be a brilliant guest for the podcast. So Jenna, hi, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think there's so much good and hopefully some good light bulbs and some knowledge that can come out of this discussion. So I really appreciate all the work that you do. And thank you for having me. So hoarding used to be considered to be a subtype of OCD. Now hoarding disorder is a disorder of its own. What are the connections or links between OCD and hoarding? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, back then, several years ago, it was uh, kind of uh, considered to be a subset of OCD, right? So, you know, we would have obsessive compulsive disorder. And under that, we would have certain subtypes, right? Like contamination, harm thoughts, Um, sexual thoughts, we would have other subtypes too. And one of those subtypes was thought to be hoarding. Um, And there was some overlap. And, you know, just characteristically and clinically, you can see some of the overlap, right? Maybe a this feeling that you're compelled to go out and and acquire things, um, this feeling or the sense of urgency that like you have to keep and, and hold on to things, these kind of erroneous beliefs about the significance of belongings and how awful things will be if you have to get rid of them, so on and so forth. So there's, you can see why there's overlap. Um, obviously, lots of anxiety involved if someone were to get rid of their things unexpectedly or have to get rid of their things. I think even, even like checking 
you've got to check the rubbish bags before you throw them out in case something has got into the bag that shouldn't have been there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and OCD is the doubt disorder, right? So it always latches on to like the what if. Um, and you can see a lot of that in hoarding and individuals who struggle with hoarding, right? So it's like, well, what if I might need that? What if I get rid of that? And that makes me, you know, a bad mom, because that reminds me of my son who passed away, right? So, you know, I think that's kind of why it made sense in in some ways and why that those connections were made. It's like, you can see the overlap, you can see the what ifs, you can see the doubt, you can see there's this behavior that should make sense. And that should be normal, right? To get rid of a newspaper or to get rid of mail or to get rid of this old t-shirt that doesn't fit anymore. Um, But then we have this doubt creep in, right? Like, what if that is important? What if, what if, what if? And so that to me is probably a big portion of why they were connected. But yeah, from the early 90s through pretty much 2012, hoarding was thought of as an OCD subtype, but they are also significantly and consistently, there are a lot of differences. So finally, when the DSM-5 came about, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, hoarding got its own due diligence and is finally listed as its own condition. Now, it is still a related um, condition to OCD. So we know that a lot of times they are comorbid, a lot of times that people who a lot of times people who have hoarding disorder, they also have tendencies that are consistent with traditional OCD, that individuals who have, you know, straightforward OCD, but not specifically struggling primarily with hoarding, they may also, you know, be um, more vulnerable to those erroneous beliefs that we see in hoarding. So there's definitely some overlap, but they're also very consistently and significantly different in a lot of ways as well. I interviewed a while ago, a woman called Dr. Sharon Moraine, who had done some research into ADHD and hoarding and she was very interested in that and it feels similar to me in that a lot of people with ADHD have hoarding symptoms and a lot of people who hoard have ADHD symptoms but that doesn't mean they're the same or always connected and it feels like that with OCD as well there can you can have both and you can have one with some of the other but it's not necessarily there. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are also, I can see the overlap there too. And there are some associated features with hoarding. So one of them is indecisiveness, right? So there's a lot of indecisiveness about like, well, I know that I don't need this, but I think I might need it. And I, I don't, but I don't really need it. And, you know, there's just like this indecisiveness, right? And so surely anyone out there who struggles with ADHD or hoarding or both can relate to that. Um, there's also this, you know, sometimes this perf- this air of perfectionism, right? Like that they want to have it just a certain way and it has to be perfect. There's avoidance, flares of avoidance in both ADHD and um, hoarding. A lot of procrastination, right? Like, oh, I'll get to that tomorrow. I'll organize that tomorrow or I'll get to that next time. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not, I, I know I need to get rid of that, but I'll get rid of it next time. I, I need to get rid of stuff. Not right now. A lot of times people more recently are thinking of hoarding as being an executive functioning kind of condition where there's a lot of difficulty planning, a lot of difficulty organizing tasks, um, there's high distractibility. And so everything that I just listed, right, the distractibility, avoidance, yeah. um, indecisiveness, difficulty planning, I'm sure we can see how those could be also very comorbid with each other. I have a diagnosis of OCD from years and years and years ago which I've never talked about on the podcast before, not because it's a big secret, but because it feels for me like the two are entirely unrelated. I feel like my OCD symptoms are so different to my hoarding symptoms. Is it possible, this may be too big a question or too personal a question, but is it possible to have the two in parallel but unrelated? For sure. I think mental health is completely, it's so (laughs) complex, right? So of course, right? Of course. Um, So yeah, I mean, there's definitely some common comorbidities like we've talked about. So 75 of people who struggle with hoarding have a comorbid mood or anxiety disorder. Um, But the most common disorders that are comorbid with it are going to be obsessive compulsive disorder. But that only happens about 20% of the time. But in, within that 20% of the time that there is overlap, I would absolutely say that anything is possible. Sometimes they could inflate one another. Sometimes it might be a seesaw effect. Sometimes it's completely different. And, and that's just how complex the human brain can be for you. When I was diagnosed, the psychiatrist basically said, oh, this is an unusual thing. And I was treated, 
he was just fascinated by me rather than helpful about it. Aww, because I, I know, because I, I have compulsions without obsessions. And so he was going, oh, that doesn't happen very often. And just I felt like, I don't know, I was in a zoo or something. Yeah, that's that's not a that's not helpful, right? And so, you know, I think it's way more helpful to kind of have as a professional hopefully have that open mind like sure, I mean nothing's off the table. People are complex. People are complicated. Mental health is not one size fits all. It's it's never what we expect. We have to be open to the fact that literally anything can happen. Yeah. So if somebody listening recognizes themselves in your description of how OCD and hoarding can manifest or interplay, where should they start in addressing that? So first things first, I think the fact that they're even really like exposing themselves to this type of content and trying to get education and, you know, motivational interviewing and like the different stages of change of motivation, um, like pre-contemplation, contemplation, there's several other ones too. I think that shows, right, that just like you are just the fact that you are open to having these discussions and open to taking in this information shows that you are to some degree motivated to change, right? And you have some insight into the fact that this is something that you want to work on. Um, But there are clear differences, right, between like hoarding and collecting. So obviously hoarding is going to be where a lot of the possessions are unorganized. Collecting is just kind of these organized possessions. Um, If someone is collecting, it's that they have a lot of pride in their possessions. They show off their collection and enjoy sharing it with others. There's a lot of satisfaction from a new possession. They manage their money well. They budget their time well. Someone who is struggling with hoarding may hide their home, have a hard time having people over. They may be in debt. Um, They may get lost in time kind of shopping or organizing or gathering things. There's a lot of shame um, It kind of that's experienced with that whole process. So, I mean, I think you're, I think anyone out there is doing an incredible job just opening themselves up, but, you know, really identifying, you know, something that as therapists we're always looking for is to what extent is this causing distress and impairment in your life? So distress and impairment are um, really important kind of key factors when it comes to getting a diagnosis. So to what extent does this cause distress in your everyday life? To what, you know, to what degree is this causing impairment in your day-to-day functioning? Um, You know, as far as the criteria goes, it comes down to that persistent difficulty of uh, getting rid of or parting with items. Um, There's a feeling that you need to save it and it would cause too much distress to get rid of it. There's obviously also the um, difficulty with uh, acquiring continually new things. So, yeah. So first things first. Right. And I hope that people can get help if they want to get help. Right. Like I hope that they could do it um, hopefully in a in a way that's like we call it harm reduction right? Like we want to keep first and foremost, we want to keep people safe. We want to make sure that, you know, that there's no papers right by the stove. We want to make sure that there are walkways. We want to make sure that the bathroom is accessible and all that stuff. But especially if someone is feeling motivated for change, we can absolutely treat that. So um, as with most mental health conditions, we can't cure it. There's not like a magic pill that you can take. Um, But there are effective interventions, the one most effective being cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, with some uh, psychoeducation and exposure and response prevention in there. Uh, And there's lots that can be done to really mitigate your symptoms and to try to still live a really fulfilling life. So you yourself developed postpartum OCD. Is that something you feel comfortable talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, I would always kind of call myself an anxious person. I remember in school, uh, some of my earliest memories were like mostly with social anxiety in hindsight, I would get really nauseous before going to a new class or, you know, who am I going to sit next to in the cafeteria? What if someone calls on me and I don't know the answer? But even from a young age, I knew very early on that the only thing worse than like being called on or sitting with someone new in the cafeteria is just sitting in my own anxiety and like letting anxiety win. And so even from a super early age, I would go out of my way to sit with the scariest person at lunch. I would go out of my way to raise my hand and ask the questions. Um, And so when I, in college, when I learned that that was actually a treatment, that that it's it's exposure and response prevention, it's an evidence-based treatment for OCD and anxiety and um, somewhat what we use for hoarding as well, uh, I just loved it. I fell in love with it. 
But when I had my son back in 2018, he's four and a half now, um, I really struggled with harm intrusive thoughts, with sexual intrusive thoughts, um, thoughts that we don't want to have that are completely incongruent with our sense of self. Um, And that was really devastating. It was completely debilitating. I didn't know how after my maternity leave, I would return to work. Um, It got to the point where I was suicidal. I had some suicidal ideation in there. I wanted to roll out of a moving vehicle was always kind of my intention and plan. Um, And eventually, luckily, a year and a half later, so even therapists wait long to go to therapy. It's scary for us. (laughs) We're not always the best at taking our own advice. Um, But yeah, I luckily was able to get into a therapist and went through my own cognitive behavioral therapy experience. And um, oh my gosh, it's, it's, been so helpful. I'm a better mom for it. I'm a better therapist for it. Um, And it's still something that every day I have to work on, right? Like even this morning as I'm getting ready with my son and I'm changing his diaper and like getting him ready for school and stuff, I'm like, there's still intrusive thoughts, man. There's still intrusive thoughts there. But, you know, I don't give into them. I don't let anxiety rule my day anymore. um, And I can just roll with it so much better. And before you got help yourself, Had you diagnosed yourself as a therapist or were you so kind of immersed in it that you didn't know what was going on? So I think that as as most people out there who have OCD and probably other conditions too, we always find a reason to believe that it's not like that, that, oh yeah, everyone else has OCD, but not, (laughs) right? Like I'm just being a bad mom, right? Like I'm just awful. I'm just going crazy. I'm just losing my mind. Um, And that's the doubt disorder again for you, right? It's like, oh, yeah, I know exactly. I meet all of this criteria, but I'm just a bad mom. Like, I just can't get it together. And it's really sad, you know, like when you're in the depths of mental health like that, that you just can't see things clearly and you don't give yourself the compassion that you would give somebody else. So in hindsight, 100%, I I should have diagnosed myself. (laughs) Um, But I think that's why I didn't get help for the longest time is because it's like I – I was not giving myself the compassion that I would have given a friend. Um, I was, I it was like, no, I'm just a bad mom. I'm just a bad mom for having these thoughts. I imagine, especially when it's tied in with parenting, the tendency to blame yourself or to not admit to things is probably even stronger because there's suddenly, I'm not a parent, but I know enough parents to know that the world suddenly starts judging you for everything. Everything. The way you feed your baby, whether you go to work, whether you don't go to work, you know, there's nothing that mums especially can do right in many ways. So I imagine it feels very difficult to say, I'm struggling with these thoughts that are quite horrible. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think with OCD, right, like so many of us, um, there's this misrepresentation and this misunderstanding that it's just about contamination and that it's just about having things be perfect and orderly and symmetrical and all that. And those cases can be debilitating. They definitely exist and they can be debilitating. So I'm not going to, I don't want to take away from that, but it's the taboo things that no one talks about right? So it's not that it doesn't exist. It's just that people aren't talking about it. There's not a media TV outlet that wants to highlight sexual intrusive thoughts as their main character. Someone with contamination, sure, it's easier to talk about. Um, But yeah, I mean, so many women out there, the vast majority of women and new parents in general experience unwanted intrusive thoughts, but they just sit in silence. They suffer in silence because there's this fear of like, oh my gosh, like no one else is talking about it. So it must just be me. If I say that to someone, they're going to think I'm crazy. They're going to think I'm a bad parent. They're going to think that I'm not enjoying and loving every moment. Like everyone says we should. Um, And I mean, even my doctor, when I went to my doctor who knew that I was an expert in OCD and I was very well known in my small little community for being an OCD specialist, um, You'd think that if I went to a doctor and was and told her about my intrusive thoughts that that she'd take me seriously, but she kind of joked with me. She kind of said like, huh, welcome to new motherhood, like where you're anxious for no reason." And I was like, "That's that's not cool. <laughs> like that's not okay. Like I'm not okay with living my life that way. Like and like I I know myself. Like I know that this is not normal." And so I, I like was, I'll never forget that. And I did advocate for myself, luckily, 
but how many women aren't like how many women aren't able and don't feel confident enough or knowledgeable enough to be able to say like, no, this isn't just new motherhood. I'm really struggling. I want to roll out of a moving vehicle. I need help now. Like how many women just take that from their trusted doctor and are like, okay, I guess this is my life now. Like it's awful to think about that. Yeah. I have a friend who, when she first had her baby, she'd gone for a walk with the baby and was at the top of a hill and thought, if I let go now, the baby will roll down the hill and end up in the traffic at the bottom. Yeah. And she couldn't, she wasn't going to let go, but she couldn't shake off this this thought. And yeah. for her, it was a one-off. It didn't stick. It didn't happen again. But it was so strong and powerful for her that even that single experience of it went to some degree, she knew it wasn't rational. There was no reason she was going to let go of the mm-hmm. baby. But if that's happening day in, day out, for sure, it's, it's exhausting. And so you're bringing up so many awesome points here. So research shows that no matter where you're at in the world, no matter what your mental health background is, your socioeconomic status, people have intrusive thoughts. They've actually done research to show that if we get someone who has OCD and someone who does not have OCD and we ask both of them for two weeks to write down all their intrusive thoughts that you can't discern at the end of the two week period of who has OCD and who doesn't. Wow. So it just goes to show that like we all have the same thoughts. Like there are other thought, there are other moms out there who had all the same types of thoughts that I had, but where people with OCD go a little bit different is that they tend to think that those thoughts are significant somehow. They interpret those thoughts as being significant. So, you know, while your friend was able to kind of have that thought, notice it and let it go, it was obviously distressing to some degree. Someone who's more vulnerable and has like that sticky brain might interpret significance from that thought. Like, I just had that thought. What does that mean about me? What does that mean about me that I had that thought? That must mean that I'm a horrible parent the fact that I had that thought must somehow mean that I want to do that. Why did I have that thought? And they want to, people with OCD, they tend to want to control the thoughts, right? Like, oh my gosh, don't think that thought again. Don't think that thought again. No matter what you do, do not think that thought again. And you can imagine, right, that they may never go near hills again. They may never walk their baby again. They may never go outside with their baby. Yeah. And you can see how, like, it's that fork in the road situation. So the problem is not the intrusive thought. The problem is whether or not we interpret it as being significant. And as someone who has OCD, it's really hard, especially when it latches onto something that you value. And as a new mom, there's so much stress anyway. It is just a Petri dish for you to have these thoughts stick. So yeah, that's such a great example. I think something that OCD and hoarding have in common, not clinically, but societally, I guess, is that they're both used in conversation by people who don't know. You know, someone says, oh, I'm so OCD. I'm so OCD. I've got to tidy up my desk because I'm so OCD. Or, oh, I didn't throw away that thing. I'm such a hoarder. And it's miles off. And that means certainly when I got the OCD diagnosis, I was like, but I don't particularly wash my hands a lot like that was my understanding of what OCD was it was washing your hands a lot whereas what I do is it's all in my head I put everything in alphabetical order and because of that lack of well it's not even the lack of public knowledge it's the misuse of Mm -hmm. one feature of something I guess that gets into popular culture and means that people don't really understand the bigger picture yeah and I I think people mean well. It's a total naivety thing. It's just a, a it's just, you know, well-intentioned ignorance. Um and that's why advocacy is so important. It's like in order to really get the word out there about what OCD is, I think we need to have more of these like brutal conversations about like, yeah, OCD is actually thinking that, you know, that you may like did I actually did I did I actually need to uh, tuck my son's penis down in his diaper? I mean, he is four and a half. Do I really need to be doing that right now? Or did you like to do that? Like, right. but people don't want to talk about that, right? But by me saying it, someone else listening might be like, oh my gosh, I thought that I was the only one. And that's like the the spark. That's the spark that I want people to get is like, oh my gosh, like 
I'm not crazy. I'm not like this quote unquote disgusting person. Um, I'm not like the odd one out who just has these really ridiculous thoughts. Like other people have those thoughts too. And it's so good to know that you're not alone. It's the, it's like the most, these are the most isolating kinds of conditions. They're so full of shame, so full of guilt. Um, It's just really terrible. So knowing that you're not alone is really important. Absolutely. Flexibility is great. That's why there's yoga. Flexibility for your insurance coverage is great too. That's why there's United Healthcare Insurance Plans. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, United Healthcare Insurance Plans offer flexible, budget friendly coverage for medical, vision, dental, and more. One of these plans may be right for you if you're, say, between jobs, coming off your parents' plan, turning a side hustle into a full hustle, or even missed open enrollment. Want more flexibility? Find out more about United Healthcare Insurance Plans at uh1.com. Hey everyone, I'm Craig Robinson, co host of the Ways to Win podcast alongside my good friend, John Calipari. I've been on the go recently. Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash post. I think it's interesting that you were a therapist first and then yeah. developed OCD because I, you hear a lot of somebody who has some experience with, with mental ill health of some kind and then goes into becoming a therapist. And so has your own experience with OCD affected your practice affected the way you treat oh people? A hundred percent. So, and I totally recognize that. And I think that just goes to show that no one is immune from this, right? Like I, I started studying and working just with people who have OCD and related conditions, including hoarding starting in 2008. I had my son in 2018. Right. So I had been working, I'd spoken at national conferences. I had been pu- a published author. Like I I was I was working in the uh, number one residential facility for OCD anxiety and hoarding at Rogers Memorial Hospital here in uh, the United States in Wisconsin. I had some pretty good experience under my belt, and so I remember even when I was pr- like super pregnant, and I remember thinking, you know, like, you know, like I'm a first time mom, I handle stress okay, maybe I would be susceptible to postpartum depression or you know some anxiety or things like that. But OCD, no way. Like I would never ask my husband to do anything <laughs> for me because of anxiety. I would never check my son in the middle of the night. I would never do that. And I remember my very first intrusive thought. And like I said, I've always been anxious, right? I've always been like an anxious person. I would have said, In the past, I probably would have met criteria for social anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder, Um, but this was different. This was an intrusive thought that came out of nowhere, Like, and a a lot of people who have OCD, not always, but they can almost like bring it back to that specific thought, like the thought that 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 broke their brain is a lot of times how we describe it. For me, it was, I was in my bedroom, my husband and me were there, I was changing my now newborn son, he was three weeks old. And I was putting socks on him and I had this intrusive thought, like, what if I just snapped his ankles? Right. Like, and then I had this intrusive thought, like, what does that mean about me? Like, does that, does that mean that I would want to do that? Like, can I be trusted to change his clothes when I'm a little bit frustrated or angry? And I was like, I remember backing away, like with my hands up like this and just saying like, "Uh -uh, no, mm -mm, I'm not doing that. And I backed away. And I made my husband put on the socks. And soon enough, it was not just socks, it was pants, and then it was shirts, and then it was coats, and then it was diapers, and then it was just so many other things. It eventually got so bad. I I started as most new parents do experience, I started to, you know, get really sleep deprived, wasn't taking good physical care of myself. And I started to worry am I so sleep deprived that I bashed his head in and I don't remember. And I would check his body for hours. I would undress him and check every fold and every crevice and every angle of his head. And then I would put him down. And by the time that I got back to my bed on the opposite side of the house, I would say, wait, am I so sleep deprived? Did I just dream that? And I would have to go back and do it all over again. And it got to the point where I was waking up my husband in the middle of the night 
to do it for me because I was like, well, at least if I, at least like he can do it. I, I, he's not as sleep deprived as me. I trust him more than I trust myself. And I was like, yeah, so there I am. And, and then in comes the shame and guilt because I'm like, I know I shouldn't be doing this. Why am I doing this? Like, I know, I know exactly what this is. I should not be doing these, these things. But what kept coming up for me was the stakes are too high. Like the stakes are too high. I don't care if I'm giving into a ritual right now. I am checking to make sure that my baby is okay. Like I don't freaking care. And I finally got it. I remember, and I'm not a super religious person, but I remember begging and negotiating with God. Like if you, I I will never like gaslight or like misunderstand or like, I don't know what the right word is, but like, I will never underestimate someone else's suffering with OCD. Like if you just take this from me, like if you just take this from me, I will never again, underestimate like how bad someone is struggling because I used to get so frustrated. Like, you know, you shouldn't ritualize. Why are you doing it? (laughs) Um, But here I was right. Like 10 years of experience under my belt. And I'm asking my husband to go and check my son. And so I remember pleading with God, like, please, if you just take this from me, I won't underestimate this ever again. And so obviously went through my own therapy and everything like that. And thank goodness. But yeah, I went back after my maternity leave and I was so much more compassionate. I got it for the first time. I freaking got it. Like I really got it. But I also knew that like you kind of have to hit that bottom, right? Like you have to get to the point where like I can't keep living my life this way anymore. I'm willing to take those. I'm willing to sit with those doubts. I'm willing to sit with that anxiety. I'm willing to do literally whatever it takes so that I don't continue to have to live my life this way. Um, so 100%, it has changed everything for me. And mostly, I remember a, a flashbulb memory. I remember a year and a half into my son being born. He was a year and a half old. And I remember struggling so badly. And I remember looking outside of my front door and just thinking, like, if I if I'm struggling so badly, if I'm struggling with OCD so bad, and I have all the context for it, I know exactly what's going on. I know that I'm not alone. I know that these are just intrusive thoughts and are not necessarily going to happen. And I have all that context. How are women not like killing themselves? Really? Yeah. Like, it's crazy to me, because I felt so I was so debilitated by it but I had all the knowledge in the world. Like what about people who are out there who don't have that knowledge? It was just super heartbreaking. So that's when I started my podcast, my Instagram. And I was like, I have to reach moms however I can. And so presumably at least some of your clients know that you have experience of it yourself. Yeah. And you, I mean, it could go either way. Like I thought that it would go either way, but like people are usually so much more trusting of me because They know that I've been there and they know that I am not just like applying these rules to them without having done it myself. So I feel like it helps with credibility for sure. And yeah, I mean, when I can say that, like, I know, I know now, I know now kind of what it is that they're going through when they know that they shouldn't be doing something, but the stakes are just too high because I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you work with exposure and response prevention therapy. I have a regular guest on the podcast who is a therapist who works with acceptance and commitment therapy. Mm -hmm. I've had CBT. So we've talked about both of those before. and We've talked about EMDR before, but I know nothing about exposure and response prevention therapy. It's quite hard to say. Um, Can you explain what it is, first of all? Yeah, absolutely. So exposure and response prevention is the gold standard treatment. Kind of what that means is that it's the most backed by evidence. It has tons of empirical support uh, support, um, backing it. Um, It is essentially exposure and response prevention is essentially a two part problem to a two part a two part solution to a two part problem. So um, with OCD, we have the obsessions and we have the compulsions. The obsessions are those um, intrusive ideas, thoughts, images, impulses, or feelings or commands. Um, whereas the compulsions are the things either mentally or physically that you feel compelled to do to go out of your way to do to feel better about that. Um, And so exposure and response prevention is our gradual, but still it's challenging. We try to make it manageable, though. Um, It's our gradual approach of one, gradually helping that person go a little bit more and more outside of their comfort zone. 
to uh, reducing and ultimately trying to resist those compulsions or safety behaviors that they would typically have done. And then three, reducing avoidance. So, um, you know, exposure, we have them and we come up with assignments and ways to systematically and gradually have them uh, evoke their fears. Um, For me, an exposure was I had to put socks on my son. I had to put my son to bed and, you know, have that visual in my mind that there could be a big gash in his head and not go check, right? That I had to put the socks on my son and not be super careful or have (laughs) my husband right there watching just to be sure. Um, So there's this exposure element where you're doing the scary thing. And then you also have to resist the response that you're typically used to doing. So yeah, and but we tend to be a little bit more general. There's other skills that come into play when we're talking about hoarding. Um, we do more, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, addressing these erroneous beliefs around needing to save and acquiring more and all that stuff. But there is still an exposure component, um, exposure and response prevention where, yeah, I mean, in a way that's challenging but manageable, the exposures would be to, to get rid of stuff, to throw stuff away, to recycle things, to donate items. Um, We may have people as far as exposures go, maybe go for like shopless shopping, like where we kind of (laughs) walk around and we don't go shopping, Um, where people go to like garage sales and they're not able to get things. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of different things that you can do for that. But it's all about, you know, exposing yourself, allowing yourself to feel that discomfort uh, and eventually realizing that that discomfort is not dangerous. It's uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous and that I can handle it. Right. So that, you know, you know, a good exposure might be if someone was fearful of, you know, let's say their son passed away and they're afraid of like getting rid of an old t-shirt of his, I might say, you know what, like if it's too hard for us to just throw that away, let's see, how would you feel if I held on to that for the next 24 hours? Let's just see how that feels for you. Um, So it's really just, you know, testing these I think of them like behavioral experiments. Let's just let's just see what happens. And and usually they're able to cope. Usually things are not as awful as they expect them to be. And they're much more able to cope than they thought that they were. I'm thinking of things like if you have a bag of things to donate to a charity shop or something like that. And you think I'm going to put it in the car now and then tomorrow I will donate it. And the exposure is kind of putting it in the car and leaving it there. And you then need to prevent yourself from the response that might be, oh, I'll just go and check. There's nothing Mm -hmm. in there that I really want to keep hold of. I'll just, maybe I've changed my mind about that. Is it Mm -hmm. that kind of thing? Yeah. And we want to do it, though, in a way that's challenging but manageable, right? So there might be some people out there listening who are like, oh, my gosh, I could never do that. Well, what if we might have to start with just talking about throwing away things? We might have to just throw away a single sheet of paper um, that you've inspected first, right? Like, okay, I, I'm going to get 30 seconds to inspect it, and then I have to throw it away. Um, you might, we might have you like throw away junk mail without bringing it into the house, right? Um, there's obviously some more, you know, challenging things that you could do, like throwing away more sentimental things. Um, but so there's definitely ways to make it manageable. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, Another tactic that people do is it's called like four boxes. So essentially that you get four boxes, you get one box to keep, one box to throw away, one box to recycle, and one box to donate. And you don't get a new box until you've filled all four of them. So you're going to get like a lot in the keep box probably, but you don't get another keep box until you've filled up the donate, recycle, and throw away box. Um, and there's other little things that people can do too, like as they're like on their recovery journey, right? Like having, um, like a shredder, right? Right. When you get in the door, right? Like automatically like magazines, junk mail, it automatically goes in the shredder. We just don't even keep it. Like we don't even look at, we don't even go through all that stuff. Um, you know, you might have to have kind of like a daily time each day to like sort through items. Um, you might need to enlist kind of a professional organizer to assist in just maintaining everything. You might need to, there's also some like family promises that might have been made, right? Like grandkids, right? Like you can see the grandkids once you get your house cleaned. Well, then the promises need to be fulfilled, right? Like if I've cleaned my house and we need to make sure that family is holding up to their end of the bargain, Um But then we would also obviously work on challenging the hoarding, right? Like, do you need this or do you just really want it? Yeah. (laughs) Right. Um, 
what will be the benefits of actually acquiring this? What would be the disadvantages of acquiring this? Um, like I said, we might do, you know, some garage sales or some yard sales without actually stopping and buying anything. Um, and you'd have to make rules too for that ongoing recovery, right? So, you know, how much is okay to acquire? Um, what's like a monthly budget or a weekly budget? What is okay to acquire? Um, what gets thrown out immediately? Like, I don't even get to inspect it anymore. So there's lots of things that can be done. Um, so, you know, there's there's lots of hopefulness out there. Absolutely. I'm a big believer in if you have a whole house to dehoard and you get to a pile of things that is just too difficult, like it might be the really sentimental stuff or the right. thing that whatever it is that you personally find the hardest, if you've got the rest of your house still to do, go to an easier bit and do that first. Totally. And it sounds like that's a similar approach. You're not throwing people in with the hardest exposure that is you're starting them in a place where they won't be too overwhelmed they may feel overwhelmed but it's kind of progressive yeah absolutely yeah we don't want to throw anybody into the deep end the whole mantra here is challenging but manageable and I would say for probably most people it's the sentimental stuff that's going to be the absolute hardest um so yeah I mean we use where I work, we do a scale of zero to 10. Um, so like on a scale of zero to 10, how difficult would it be for you to throw away this item? How difficult would it be? Well, then it would, if that was maybe a seven, well, how difficult would it be for you to recycle it or to donate it? Sometimes it's easier to donate than to just completely throw it out. Yeah. Um, so that's an option too. But yeah, I mean, it is always going to be uncomfortable. If it was easy to get rid of this stuff, then you would have already done it. So um, don't wait for things to be 100% a sigh of relief and feel good about it because that's not going to happen. Um, anything that's that's different from your status quo is going to feel a little bit anxiety provoking and awkward. But, you know, I would keep your eye on the price too, right? Like what are the things that you want to do instead of being in your, in the clutter, right? Like wanting to spend time with family, um, you know, wanting to spend time doing other valued activities. Cause a lot of times people are like, well, what would I do instead? Right? Like what would I do instead? Um, and there's so many other things that, that they can do. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's thinking about, you know, you get to see your family again. You get to work on the garden. You get to get new carpeting. You get to fix some of those appliances. Maybe you would volunteer more, do the things that you value. Um, so yeah, re you know, really remembering that 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 pain and that discomfort is temporary. And yeah, that's why I love a little exposure. It's like, well, what if you just give it to me for 24 hours? Like, let's see if you actually do miss it that much. Let's see if you do forget your child who passed away, even after you give it to me for 24 hours. Um, because usually it feels very dangerous to get rid of those items. But once they've like temporarily given it away, they realize it actually feels good, like that they're making good progress and they're a little bit more motivated to get rid of it permanently. I do think often imagining it feels or can feel worse than actually doing it totally I recently I was I think I was just testing myself a bit I had this old tin that had like I think someone had given me a tin of chocolates or something like that and I'd had this tin around for years and I would sometimes keep things in it and sometimes wouldn't and it had got quite battered and it wasn't pretty, but it was occasionally useful. And I thought, what if I got rid of that tin? And I immediately was going, well, it is kind of useful in this situation. And it's kind right. of useful in this situation. But I also thought it is kind of useful, but I have no particular like attraction to it. I don't feel attached to it. I just feel like it's useful. And I wonder what that will be like if I get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And and we can come up with a usefulness for anything, right? Like absolutely. A, a broken Frisbee. Like we could we could donate that to the local art studio and they could make a mosaic out of it. Exactly. Yeah. But come on, right? Like so if we if we allow ourselves, we can come up with another use for anything, but we also have to take a look at what is, right? Like what is is that my life has become and, and the areas in my home have become unlivable because of the totality of all of these things. 
And I, the reality is if I want to meet my goals, I have to make some of these decisions. And some of those yeah. decisions are going to be resulting in us getting rid of things. So yeah, like the broken Frisbee. Yeah. yeah. Someone could take that and make it into like a mosaic and an art in like an art class. The world also will go on if they don't get that. That's okay. it. And so I did throw away the tin. And Good. I know. And it has been absolutely fine. A couple of times I've like needed a container and I've thought, oh, that tin would have worked. But I haven't felt particular regret, even in those moments. It's just been like, oh, that tin would have worked. But what do I still have that could right. work? And it's as like, well? we all do that, right? Yeah. Like there's always, the reality is, is that sometimes we make mistakes. Yeah. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're really small and, you know, easily fixable, but we also, yeah, I mean, if this is something that people want to change, the reality, like, you can't have it both ways, right? Like, you can keep everything and get rid of everything at the same time. There's got to be some some compromise there. And for me, I'm sure that because I didn't feel any particular attachment to it, that made it a thousand times easier. Right. Had it been, like, a letter from a departed loved one it would have been a much bigger decision and the regret it was like you were saying earlier the stakes feel a lot higher than an old chocolate tin and and being compassionate with yourself with that too right like I by no means struggle with hoarding disorder but I feel like as a hu- as part of the human condition right like those sentimental items are harder to get rid of than they are. objectively objective trash, right? Objective things that we have no use for. So, you know, we all, as part of human nature, we attach emotional meaning to certain things. You know, I have a whole room in my downstairs basement of like my son's first like infant outfits and stuff like that. And I have a ro- I have erroneous beliefs too, that like one day I'll give them to his kids and one day, you know, I'll take pictures with it. And it's like, I will probably never do those things, but you know, it's also not impacting my life. It's also not super distressing. And if it is distressing and impeding someone's life, then they can start to make decisions. And it doesn't have to start with the sentimental stuff. Wouldn't even go there. I would start with like the junk mail. I would start with the um, like hazards too, right? So I would like start with like harm reduction. So making sure that like the bathroom is accessible, making sure that you have a place to sit, making sure that there's no fire hazards, making sure that nothing is on the staircase, making sure if there is a fire, you have a walkway, um, really just thinking about priorities and the sentimental items, they don't even need to be thought about for a long time, if ever, right? Like it's it's about sometimes just like getting some of your house back. Absolutely. I really agree. So it's so interesting to get your perspective. It's really helpful. If people want to find you online, where can they do so? So I live primarily over on Instagram. Um, I'm at jenna.overbaugh on Instagram. Um, as you mentioned, I also have my own podcast called All the Hard Things, uh, anywhere where podcasts are. Um, and then if anyone is needing special services for hoarding, um, we do offer um, treatment for hoarding also. Um, we're at www.treatmyocd.com. Um, if anybody out there is looking for a therapist, um, you can ask if I'm available. I would love to work with some of you on this. Um, you know, I really love helping people with this, especially when they're open to it, right? Um, you know, if, if you're thinking about wanting help, then we can absolutely help you um, because the evidence is out there, the treatments are out there, and we can help you get to a better place of functioning. So um, between Instagram, my podcast, and uh, treatmyocd.com, hopefully those are some really good resources for people out there who are listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate talking to you. Thank you. It was really nice to talk with you. Do you have any burning questions you'd love me to answer? I'll get to the top tip in a second. But my first Q&A episode was really popular. So I'm going to be open to questions on a rolling basis. And then when I have enough, I'll make another episode answering them. Contact me on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or plain old email. All the links are on my website at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Ask me anything and I will do my best to answer it. Now, your top tip. So my top tip this week is a quote from the ever-wonderful Maya Angelou. And she says, Do the best you can until you know better. Then, when you know better, do better. Okay, thank you for listening. And I will speak to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding podcast. 
You can find more online at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. You can find me on Twitter at That Hoarder and on Facebook at Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder. To find out more about how you can support this podcast and the overall project, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk forward slash support and do subscribe to this podcast so you make sure you don't miss any future episodes. one 800 flowerscom is more than your birthday, anniversary, or just because gift-giving destination. We put our hearts into everything we do to help you celebrate all life's special occasions with friends and family. From our farmers and bakers, florists and makers, everything from 1-800-Flowers is made with love every step of the way. Because we know that nothing is more important than delivering a smile. To learn more, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST.